The King with Six Friends by J. Williams Illustrated by Amero Gobato There are many nice things about being a king, but there is one very bad thing. That is, that it's very hard to find a job if you're out of work. All that a king can do is rule, and if you have no kingdom, then you're out of work. This is what happened to young King Tsar. He was a good king, but he was young and without much experience. A bold, strong king with many soldiers attacked his kingdom. When the battle had ended, the strong king had won, and young Tsar found himself with no country, with no palace, or house, or hut. The strong king had even taken his crown. Tsar had twelve gold pieces, a suit of clothes, and a sword, so he set out to find work. The road was long and the world was wide. He went to many lands, but no one wanted to hire a king without a kingdom. He had never known what it's like to be hungry or thirsty or tired before, but now he learned. Fortunately, as a king, Tsar had already learned how to meet happiness or unhappiness with the same cheerful smile. One day, his road led him through a thick forest. As he walked along thinking of this and that, he heard a small voice crying, Pull me out! Oh, please pull me out! He looked about him. There, in a log, an axe was stuck fast, and the small voice seemed to be coming from its blade. Tsar took hold of the handle, and with a twist freed the axe. At once it turned into a man, and he had a sharp face and shining hair the color of steel. Many thanks, stranger, he said. I was cutting wood for a fire when my blade hit a tough knot, and there I stopped. But if you can turn yourself into a man, why didn't you do so? asked Tsar. Then you could have freed yourself. Not at all, said the other, for my nose would have been caught firmly in the log. I'm grateful to you. Tell me how you are, and where are you going? Tsar told his story. You're a king after my own heart, said the other, whose name was Edge. I'll join you and help you seek for your fortune. And off they went together. When nightfall came, Edge turned himself into an axe, cut wood, and they had a fine fire at which to eat their bread and cheese. The next day, as they went along the dusty road, Tsar heard a great bellowing. He turned aside to look. There, backed up against a rock, stood an elephant. Its trunk was raised in fright. A white-footed mouse scampered in the grass before it. When he returned, the elephant had turned into a large, lumbersome man with thick skin, large ears, and little pink eyes. Many thanks, stranger, said the man. Tiny things like nice give me the shivers. I was paralyzed with fear at the sight of that one. But, said Tsar, if you can turn into a man, why didn't you do so? Then you could have chased off the mouse. Ah, but when I'm a man, I'm just as frightened of mice as when I'm an elephant, replied the man. Now tell me who you are and where you're going, Tsar explained. Splendid, said the man, whose name was Agus. You're just the fellow for me. I'll go with you and help you find a job. They went on, all three, and after a bit it began to rain. They took shelter under some trees, and all at once Tsar heard a small, crackly voice crying, Help! Help! Looking around, he spied a fire burning with much smoke and smolder. The voice came from its center. Tsar took off his cloak, and he held one end of it while Angus held the other. They stretched it over the fire and sheltered it from the rain. Soon it had blazed up brightly once more. When it had done so, it turned into a man with bright red hair and freckles like sparkles. Many thanks, stranger, he cried, snapping his fingers. I thought I was done for. But if you can turn yourself into a man, said Tsar... Why did you not do so? Then you could have taken shelter from the rain. Ah, said the other, whose name was Kendall. But the rain came suddenly and weakened me, so I had no strength left. Now tell me who you are and where are you going? When he had heard Tsar's story, he cried, Good, I will join you and your companions, for it is sad to travel without friends in the world. They all four marched on together, and now they never lacked for warmth or a cooking fire. One evening, as they were making their camp, Tsar heard a hissing like that of a hundred tea kettles boiling. <sniffs> he went to look, and his friends came with him. They found a huge black serpent with its tail tied in a knot. It writhed helplessly, trying to untangle itself. Tsar stepped forward, although Edge said, Leave it loon. If you get too close, it may swallow you or crush you up in its coils. 
But Tsar had a soft heart. He bent over the serpent, and with all of his strength untied the knot. At once the serpent turned into a man, tall, slender, and with a dark and shining skin. Many thanks, stranger, he said in a soft voice. I tried that knot in my tail out of pride to see if I could be done, and then I could not undo it. But if you can turn yourself into a man, said Tsar, why didn't you do so? Then you could have untied yourself. Do you think so? smiled the other, whose name was Eric's. Can you imagine what it would be like to have your legs tied into a knot? But come, tell me who you are and where are you going? Tsar did so. Excellence, said Eric's. I've been looking for someone to travel with, for the road has been long and lonely. Then they all went on together in great friendship. Before long they came to the top of a high hill. There among small trees stood a taller, mightier one. As they rested beneath it, looking at the valley below, a sighing voice came from the tree. Alas, it said, O gloom and worrisome low. Tsar stood close to its bark. Is there someone in trouble? he asked. Look up in my branches, said the voice. Do you see the ewe's nest? There are four of them, and they're filled with baby birds which cry and scream all day and night till I never, ever, ever get any rest. If only I could be free of them. Tsar climbed the tree. Carefully, he lifted down the four nests. With the help of his companions, he placed the nest in four smaller trees, while the parent birds flew anxiously about to make certain all was well. When this was done, the tree turned into a dignified-looking man, whose hair and beard were as shaggy as moss. "'Many thanks, stranger,' he said in a slow, deep voice. "'You cannot know what a relief it is to be rid of those nosy birds.' "'But,' said Tsar, "'if you can turn yourself into a man, why didn't you do so? "'Then you could have disposed of the nest yourself.' "'Not so,' replied the other, whose name was Furs. "'For the instant I became a man, the nest would have fallen and the young birds would have been killed. "'And I'm much too kind to let such a thing happen. "'But tell me who you are and where are you going?' Zara obliged. Well, "'That's good,' says Furs. "'You seem to me to be a fine sort of man, king or no king. "'I'll go with you and help you find your fortune. "'For if two heads are better than one, six are even better yet.' They all took the road down the hill and into the broad valley. At the edge of a wood they paused, for they heard a loud and angry humming mixed with snars. "'It sounds,' said Angus, "'like trouble. Let us take another road.' for in spite of his size, he was rather timid. But Tsar strode forward to see what was happening. He found that a brown bear was breaking its way into a honey tree. A swarm of bees buzzed about it, but the long, thick fur of the bear protected it from its stings. Zu drew his sword and ran at the bear. For a moment, it stood up to fight. But when it had been pricked once or twice by the sharp sword, it turned tail and shrambled away. At once, the swarm of bees turned into a small, fat man, with a beard the color of honey. Instead of a sting, he wore a long sword at his side. Many thanks, stranger, he said. I fear that I was about to lose all the honey I had saved for my own dinner. But if you can turn yourself into a man, said Tsar, why didn't you do so? You could have driven off the bear with your own sword. The other, whose name was Dumble, scratched his head. He was, in fact, not very bright. I never thought of that, he said. But tell me who you are and where are you going? When Tsar had done so, Dumble said, Huzzah! I will go along with you, and when you have found your fortune, you can build me a hive so there'll be no bears. So away they went, all seven, and now they had plenty of honey to spread on their bread, and the way was made easy with their joking and storytelling. There they came at length to a fine city with towers and banners, and a beautiful palace lining the banks of a busy river. They went into an inn, and bought wine and bread and cheese, and had their lunch, sitting at a bench in the sun and looking at the river. Tsar said to the pretty girl who served them, Does this land have a king? Oh, yes, she answered, and he's not a bad one either, but he's having a certain amount of trouble these days, for he's only one child, a daughter, and he cannot find a husband for her. Is she so ugly? Tsar asked. Ugly? No, she's as lovely as a spring morning after a hard winter. She is so fair that flowers close enviously at the sight of her. Then why can't she find a husband? Because, said the girl, her father has what one fault. He's terribly proud. 
He's sworn that his daughter shall marry none but a king, and unfortunately all the kings hereabouts are married already. Ah, said Tsar, then perhaps he's in luck, and so am I. He paid the girl and gave her a kiss of thanks. Then he and his six friends went up to the palace. There they were brought before the king, whose name was Invictus the Fifteenth. The ever glorious. He was a thin, worried looking man with a bad habit of biting his nails, in spite of his magnificent name. Aside from this, however, he was very royal. When he heard Tsar's name, he came down from the throne and greeted him in a kindly way. I knew your father, he said. I was very distressed at you of your misfortunes. So now you're out on a job? Exactly, said Tsar. The kingdoms I've visited already have rulers, but there is another job I'm fit for. I will make a good husband for a princess. King Invictus stroked his beard. That may be so, he said. However, you must admit they're all problems. A king with no kingdom is not much of a match, and my daughter is very rich. When I marry her, I'll be rich too, Zar pointed out. There is some certainty, some truth to that, admitted King Invictus, but I think you will agree that this case... We must use the old-fashioned method to find out whether you are worthy. I intend to set you three tests. If you pass them, you may marry my daughter. Tsar nodded thoughtfully. First, said he, let me see your daughter. King Invictus sent a servant to fetch her. In a few moments, she entered the room. When she came in, it was as though hundreds of birds began to sing, or as if the sun had burst through clouds. Tsar was dazzled, and behind him Dumma was... "'so overcome that he fainted dead away, "'and Eryx had to fan him with his hat. "'As for the princess, she looked straight at Tsar, "'and her eyes lighted like stars. "'Very well,' Tsar stammered, "'turning to King Invictus. "'I accept the test. "'Let them begin at once. I "'Ask only one thing.' "'Ask away,' said King Invictus. "'No king does everything for himself, as you know,' Tsar said. We all have counselors, generals, ministers, and servants to help us, so you must allow me to call upon my six friends to aid me in the test. King Invictus nodded. I agree, he said. But remember that if you fail any of them, you and your six companions will lose their heads. Tsar and his companions were led by the king's steward into a large chamber. It had seven walls and seven windows. Under each window was a long table, and each table was heaped high with food. Next to each table was a huge vat containing seven gallons of wine. This, said the steward, is the fist feat for a king. It is King Invectus's wish that you should eat and drink anything in this here room. All must be gone in the space of one hour, and nothing must be left. For no one may turn away unsatisfied from the dinner of a king. He left them, and for a while, Tsar stared at all the food and drink and rubbed his chin. I'm sure we're all hungry, he said. But there's enough food here for a town full of people. Perhaps, said Furs in a sober way, we ought to climb out the windows and escape. There's one window for each of us. Tsar shook his head. He turned to Kindle. Become a fire, he said. At once, Kindle turned into flames. Darting about the room, he went from dish to dish, from platter to platter. And everything he touched was consumed, devoured, burned to the finest ash, and then to nothing. Tsar said to Agus, "'Become an elephant!' "'Agus did so. "'Dipping his trunk into the vats, "'one after the other, he sucked up the wine. "'He swelled until he was twice as large as before, "'and he swayed with dizziness. "'But when he was done, every drop had vanished. "'Then both Agnes and Kindle turned into men once more. "'At the end of an hour, the steward returned. "'His eyes opened wide at the empty plates and the empty vats. "'All he said, however, was, "'Follow me!' He led them out of the castle, out of the city, and high into the hills. The land grew barren and wild, and a bitter wind blew over the rocks. Now, said the steward, it is King's and Becky's wish that you should fetch him the golden egg of the eagle of the heights. Where is this uh, egg? asked Tsar. The steward pointed ahead. Continue on this path, he said, and you'll come to a gap in the earth. On the other side there's a cliff, and on the top of that cliff is a casket. The egg is in the casket. When you have it, bring it back to the castle. As for me, if you excuse me, I'm feeling the chill. He bowed and went home to make himself a hot drink. It all sounds easy enough, 
said Eric's. The seven friends followed the path. It wound higher, and at last ended at the brink of a wide and deep gap. It was too wide to jump, and far below were sharp rocks like the teeth in a wolf's mouth. Well, said Kendall briskly, all we need is plenty of wood, saw, hammers, and nails, and we can build a bridge. A bridge we shall have, said Tsar, but we will not need to build it. And turning to Eric's, he said, Become a serpent. At once, Eric's turned into a huge serpent, coiling the tip of his tail several times around a rock. And he drew back his great body, and then shot himself forward across the gap. He seized a gnarled tree on the other side with his teeth, and held tight. One by one, the others ran across his body, as on a narrow bridge. Wait here, said Tsar, for I hope we shall come back again. Before them, there rose a huge cliff. It was like the straight wall of a house, and as smooth as glass. It was not very high, but it had no need to be, for there was no way to climb it. Tsar said to Furs, Become a tree. Furs set his long feet firmly on the ground next to the cliff. He changed shape, and there stood a tall tree, its branches making a ladder up the face of the cliff. Swiftly, Tsar climbed it. At the top of the cliff, he found a little chest. Snatching it up, he climbed down again. Furs became a man once more. Tsar examined the chest, but it seemed to be all one piece. There was no lid, no handle, no keyhole, and no key. He said to Edge, Become an axe. At once, Edge was a gleaming axe. He leaped into the air and fell with a smash upon the chest. It burst open, and from it rolled a shiny golden egg. Tsar took the egg safely away in his pocket. Then he and the others crossed the gap again over Eric's. Eric drew himself slowly back, coil upon coal, until he rejoined them. And then he became a man. He rubbed his ribs and groaned. Some of you have heavy boots, he complained. They returned to the city. They entered the throne room of the palace, and Tsar laid the golden egg in the hands of King Invictus. Good, said the king. There is but one more thing. You were driven from your kingdom, my boy. Now you must show me that you have learned to defend yourself. He clapped his hands. From the side of the room sprang soldiers, each with fierce mustaches, each bearing a huge two-handed sword. They advanced on Tsar and his friends. Dumble, said Tsar, become a swarm of bees. And in the wink of an eye, Dumble vanished in his place. There was a dark, angry cloud of bees. They flew straight at the soldiers' faces, and from the soldiers came yells of anguish and sorrow and despair. Oh, 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 help us, help us. Turning, they fled away, some of them jumping from the windows. Oh. Others hiding in the cellars, and others diving into the royal fish pond. Psh! The battle was over. When Dumble had taken the man's shape again, King Invictus the Fifteenth, the Ever Glorious. <laughs> Rebinus Ting from a stray bee said, King Zor, the tests have been passed. You've proved your right to my daughter's hand. The princess is yours. They all cheered. <laughs> Nobles and ladies filled the throne room and held young Zar, who would someday be their king. The princess was brought, and she and Zar kissed each other as the sound of all the bells in the city filled the air. The great banquet was held, and in the places of honor, beside the two kings and the princess, set Tsar's six companions, now made lords of the land. Hey, it's just one thing about the old story which I, I don't understand, said the king's steward, who was sitting at the table next to Agus. Each of you oh six had something you could do best, but it seems to me that you who passed the test, not Tsar, what he do? Agus smiled an elephant smile, his small eyes twinkling. He did what only a good king can do, he replied. He led us. The end.